Let's think for a moment. If Jesus was never married, never got married, what would Paul have said? Uh, Call you live on air. Please tell us your name. Where you're calling from? Malcolm Stein, Irvine, California. If the Messiah is a, and the Bell and Godel are the persons that do get get rid of sins for Jews or pay for Jews to remove their sins, and the Bell and Godel all had to be married, and even if his wife died, he had to get married immediately to another lady, because he always had to be married. Was Jesus Christ the Messiah? Was he supposed to be a married man as well? Because he, according to Christianity, he was supposed to forgive sins for all people. If the Cohen Cathol had to be a married man, surely Jesus Christ had to be married as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take this away. This ought to be good. This ought to be good. So the question is, if Jesus is the Messiah, the Messiah had to be a high priest. The high priest always had to be married. This is the only presupposition that's accurate. He always had to be married. If he wasn't married, he couldn't serve as high priest. But we really have to unpack all of this. Tanakh tells us about the Messiah. We have so many passages throughout the Jewish scriptures that are pregnant with messianic prophecy. And scripture tells us a lot about the Messiah and what he's going to do. He's going to give hoichocha, which means rebuke to the nations. Nations will change their ways as a result of that. The Messiah is going to bring about a worldwide peace. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4. Nation will not lift up and sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. We have Isaiah chapter 11 using the metaphor of animals that are predator and prey, that they'll lie together without conflict. That's a picture of the Messianic age. War will come to an end. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Same chapter. Isaiah 11, verse 9, the resurrection of the dead, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Isaiah 26, verse 19, the building of the Beis Hamikdash, the building of the temple. The most detailed messianic prophecies are found at the end of the book of Ezekiel. The third temple, all the way from the last three passages of Ezekiel 37, all the way to the end of Ezekiel. So we have all these messianic prophecies of the knowledge of God, of world peace. What they all have in common is, while there are hundreds of people throughout history who claim to be the Messiah, or that claim was made for them, Jesus included, what they all have in common is that not a single one of these prophecies were fulfilled. In fact, the Christian century, the first century, marked a time where the very opposite occurred. There wasn't peace, there was great war, there wasn't a temple built, rather one destroyed in the year 70. Another messianic prophecy is the ingathering of the exiles, Isaiah 43 verse 6. But the reverse happened in the first century. The Jews were exiled from their land. There was no resurrection of the dead for the faithful, as described in Daniel and many other places in Tanakh. But rather, so many Jews were murdered by the Romans in the wars that occurred. It's really throughout the first century, going right, of course, to the culmination of the Great War with Rome and the, that culminated in the destruction of the temple. So that's between 66 and 70, and then further on. We don't know the numbers exactly, but the number of Jews who were murdered in the wars with Rome was just enormous. What we're really looking at when we examine the first century when Christianity emerged is the very antithesis of the Messiah of the messianic age that the messiah is supposed to introduce it's not just jesus wasn't the messiah or we didn't want a messiah at that time we really could have used one but he is exactly what the messiah is not supposed to be and the messiah is not supposed to forgive sin 
In fact, Isaiah 59 tells us that the Messiah is supposed to come when Jacob repents. You know, people think that Jews just hate Jesus. We're just anti-Christian and therefore anti-Christ. We are so misunderstood as a people. It's, it's not against Christianity or Jesus or anything. It's nothing personal. It's just we're really into Moses. This is rabbinic Judaism, but our rabbis are Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Joshua. And every core teaching that is unique to Christianity is opposed by the Jewish scriptures. There's nothing remotely resembling this. And then the high priest part. So the Messiah can't be the high priest. In fact, he can't be a priest. Now, when we use the word priest, we mean that in a conventional sense. A priest here is a descendant of Aaron. That can't be. The reason the Messiah cannot be a priest, a Kohen, from the line of Aaron is the Messiah has to be from the house of David, which means from the tribe of Judah. You, you can't have two daddies. I'm a Kohen. I'm a priest. I'm a direct descendant of Aaron, the brother of Moses. I can't possibly be the Messiah. Why? Because I am from the tribe of Levi, and the Messiah has to be from the tribe of Judah. They can't be the same. The Christian Bible, famously in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, 5, 7, it's all over the place that Jesus is our high priest. It can't be. They can't be the same. So I, I, before we get to was Jesus married, which I think for some strange reason I have a sneaking suspicion that people are very curious about that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the high priest and the Messiah have to be different people. In fact, if what I said until now doesn't convince you, just think, think, think. It says that in Tanakh, very famously, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13, that he is going to build the sanctuary of God, and the priest will be on his throne, and he, meaning here the branch, the Messiah, will rule from his throne. And the priest, meaning the high priest, he will rule from his throne. And there will be peace or a council of peace between the two. That means unlike in history, where there was tension between, not always, but often, between who was the king and who was the high priest. But you should know that in this case that we look forward to, the Messianic age, the Mashiach, the Melech, he will sit on his throne. The high priest, he will sit on his throne. And there'll be a council of peace, coordination between the two of them. Does the Messiah suffer from multiple personality disorder? So this is completely preposterous. As I said, the book of Hebrews pushes this and is wild, way off base. It can't be both. The Messiah has to be from the tribe of Judah. The way you know your tribe is through your father. I know, I know, I know you're going, but don't you know you're Jewish by your mother? Yes, but your tribe is identified through your father. That's how the book of Numbers opens. I mean, why is the book of Numbers called the book of Numbers? What is it, an accountant's book? No, the book of Numbers begins with a census, and it tells you how to identify a person's tribe. According to your family, according to the house of your father. You can't have Two different men could not in, be your father, your biological father. It can't, it can't be, okay? Okay, got through that. There was a lot to get through on that. That really just covered 
So, so Jesus is not the Messiah. He can't possibly be the Messiah, not because we don't like him or we don't like the way Christians behaved or we don't like, you know, uh, statues. and No, it's none of that stuff. It's because of the teachings of the church. I mean, the idea that Jesus is the Messiah, let alone a divine being, a member of a Godhead, a, tri- a second person of a triune Godhead, and we are supposed to engage in ritual cannibalism by eating the body and drinking the blood, whether you believe that literally as the Roman Catholic Church does, the Eastern Orthodox Church does, or in some lesser way as the Lutherans do, or in a completely symbolic way as, well, as for instance, in, as Calvin did. It doesn't make a difference. That These ideas are repugnant to the Jewish scriptures, okay? All right, so now we got all of that done. So now we're going to talk about was Jesus married or not. Just one warning, whenever we talk about what happened in history, in this case it's in the ancient world, this is not medicine where peers have to be able to replicate what you claim in the hard sciences. History is soft. We can't replicate it. We have very limited information from the ancient world. We have no contemporaneous historian that wrote a word about Jesus. That means no one who lived during the first 30 years of the first century mentioned him. And there were people who would have, who really would have, who were alive, who who were historians. Philo of Alexandria lived exactly at that time. He was born in 11 BC. He died in the 50s. He didn't write a sneeze about it. No one did, okay? What we find in Josephus in Antiquities, which was written in 94, a, just a note here, Josephus was born in 37, which means Josephus was not alive while the Jesus of Christianity is alive. If we are to assume that what we are told in Matthew, that Jesus was born essentially in about 6 BC, I'm not going to why we know that, but we know that, till let's say his crucifixion, either 30, 33, Luke, Jesus would have been born in the year six, whatever, in the first third of the first century, Josephus was not alive. Josephus was born in 37. It's actually a very interesting year. Um, it's a, the year of Caligula, it's the year that Pontius Pilate comes down from a, th- a lot of things happened. According to everyone, Jesus is long dead. So Josephus is not a contemporary. Antiquities is written in 94. And what we find in the Testimonium Flavium of Antiquities 1833, that's a complete interpolation of the church. Our first reliable non Christian source to mention a word about Jesus is 112. And that's Pliny the Younger. And then we have Tacitus, 114. So when you ask me such a question, was Jesus married? We're talking about a degree of certainty of how confident we believe. There's no, you know, one in 10, and you could just put it on a scale and say it's somewhere there. What will surprise you is that there's no mention of this in the Christian Bible. The new, I mean, Christians somehow feel certain that Jesus wasn't married, but there is zero in the Christian Bible that mentions this, nothing. One other point, in the ancient world, it was not standard fare to mention that he was married or who his wife was. The default is, if a man was married, his wife wasn't mentioned unless it was germane to the story. But was he married? Much more likely that he was than he wasn't. The first reason, Pharisees got married. It would have been highly irregular for a Pharisee not to get married, and it would be mentioned in the Talmud if someone never got married. That would be extremely unusual. You have to presume that a religious Jew, if indeed what we are told in the Christian Bible was that Jesus emerged from the Pharisaic world, which we're told. We're not only told that he emerged from the Pharisaic world, but we are told in the Christian Bible, where the Pharisees are slammed up and down, that it is their standard of righteousness that had to be met in order for someone to have a place in the kingdom of heaven. That's the Sermon on the Mount. 
unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes. The same thing. That's the standard, Pharisaic Judaism, Matthew 23. Regardless of how the Pharisees behave, the Pharisee religious Jews are hit, banged over and over. This is a hostile witness. When we look at the Christian Bible about the Pharisees, just about their standard, their beliefs, their religious commitment, we are not looking at a document that is friendly toward religious Jews. In fact, the Gospels are filled with stories, and almost every story that is conveyed in the Gospels is some confrontation between Jesus and Pharisees. For those of you who have never read the Gospels, just take my word for it. If you have, you know what I'm saying is accurate. So when we look at these sorts of statements, this is not a friendly source. This is a hostile source that's conceding that the Jews, they have the oracles of God. I mean, that's Romans. Paul, both in his own words and what is said about him in Acts, a much later document than the letters of Paul, all claim that Paul was a Pharisee. Not just any Pharisee, but a Pharisee of Pharisees. That was the gold standard. The default baseline is, of course, he would have been married. You would need evidence to the contrary. You need evidence to show that he never got married, not the other way around. But as it turns out, we can see from many texts in the Christian Bible where it was thought that he was married. The most famous and the most obvious, I'm sure, has already occurred to the, you, the viewers, who have even a perfunctory knowledge of Paul's letters, and that's 1 Corinthians 7. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is encouraging people who are single to remain as such, virgins to remain virgins, and Paul is saying to be like me. He says, in fact, it is better to be like me. I'm the standard that you should live up to. But every person has his own gift from God. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. To those who are unmarried and those who are widows, it's good that they should remain as I am. But, in verse 9 is the kicker, if you can't control your passions, you should get married. And what's the reason? For it's better to be married than to burn. I know people watching this show right now are going, who are not familiar with this, are going, I can't believe it. But Paul says, look, ah, if you can't control your passion and so on, then it's better to be married than to burn. You understand what's conveyed here? The optimal is to be like me, like Paul, what he's saying. Now, let's think this through for a moment. If Jesus never got married, why would Paul say this? If Jesus never got married, Paul would say that it's better to be like me. He would say what he's saying all over his letters, be like Christ, who never got married. That means what we would find in Paul's letters is be like Christ, and that's what we do find, be Christ-like, be humble like Christ. In the Carmen Christi of Philippians uh, 2, verse 6 through 11, be humble like Christ, don't take what is it, it's be like Christ. That, in fact, to be like Christ, to be in Christ, for Christ to dwell in you, this is all Pauline. So think for a moment. Let's think for a moment. If Jesus was never married, never got married, what would Paul have said? Paul would say, be like Christ. That's what he would have said. And that the reason we know that that's what he says all over the place is be like Christ. Christ dwell in you. That's unique to Paul. That language we don't even find in the Gospels. Christ Jesus, you won't find that term in the Gospels. Only Paul talks that way. So therefore, just think for a moment. Just do what if. What if Jesus never got married? That would have been a very unusual thing. It would be a very striking thing. That would be the go-to for Paul. He wouldn't say, I wish that all men were like myself in 1 Corinthians 7, 7. He would say, I wish all men were like Christ. Of course, you have to be familiar with Paul's letters, but that's how Paul spoke. So therefore, to bring this all to a full circle, we're... 
going to this has nothing to do with the high priest because the Messiah is not supposed to be the high priest. He can't be the high priest. It's impossible. Jesus is not the Messiah, so he's, he fails on both accounts of being the Messiah or the high priest. But if I play the, you know, if I play the game of what, according to Christianity, what do they believe? The evidence that we find in the Christian Bible, the Pharisees, their beliefs were the highest standard, were the gold standard. They are attacked every up and down, which is important because it is clear that the writers in the New Testament viewed the Pharisees as the gold standard of observance. I say, look at the Sermon of the Mount. Look at Matthew 23. Those are just the very famous examples. And Pharisees did get married, and that was very important. And what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that makes it clear that Jesus was married. Because if he wasn't married, Paul would have said, be like Christ. Thank you very much for that. Very interesting question. Adon olam,